I was working with a client a couple of years ago and they specialise in home loans and they s were introducing some new software and I was brought in to help their trainers deliver this software across their organisation. And everyone was really anxious and very upset. They said, oh, it's really complicated. It's really complicated. You know, it's really, it's really complicated. It's really difficult. And you know what? It's also boring. It's really complicated. Did I tell you it was boring? It's boring. It's complicated. It's really difficult. We're going to have a really hard time getting everyone familiar with this software because it's really complicated and it's really boring and it's difficult. And I'm going, great. Let's see if we can make it simple. Let's see if we can make it exciting and let's see if we can get people talking about it in a positive way. So I said, tell me about this. And they said, oh, it's so complicated. This isn't going, that's okay. Tell me about it. Tell me about it. And I said, you know what? I think what we need here is we need some characters because what you're saying to me is that there's four different, there's generally four different groups of homeowners, isn't there? So I think we need to create some characters because, you know, there's the retired couple with no kids. Then there's the, you know, maybe the merged couple with lots of, lots of kids. Then there's the newly divorced woman who's, you know, wanting to buy another home or, or maybe a single person. So maybe if we just find, create some stories here, maybe if we, if we get some, some stories and create some characters that people can go, ah, oh, yes, this is that type of situation. I get it. And they said, that'd be really good. I said, okay, well, let's talk about the first, the first group. So you said that the first group is people wanting to downsize. Yeah, okay, good, good. Well, let's call them Charles and Camilla then. So there's Charles and Camilla, they've got rid of their kids and they're wanting to downsize a little bit. So now let's talk about how we introduce, how we use that software to get them the home loan that they're after. So that's great, good. Now the next group, what was that? Oh, they're two families, they've been divorced and they've got into their merging a whole lot of kids together. Great, so we've got Brad and Angelina. So this is the Brad and Angelina group. So how do we deal with that? What do we do? What are the steps they have to do, et cetera, et cetera? Yep, good, good, good. And then the next one is someone who's gone through, um, uh, is a, a young party girl. And so we, you know, she's looking for a new home, uh, quite a big one, it turns out. But, you know, how do, we, how do we help her with her mortgage? And then there's someone who's gone through conscious uncoupling and is looking for a new home. So that's what we did. And the funny thing is, is they still talk about it today. They sit down, they go, well, hang on, is this a Brad and Angelina or is this a Charles and Camilla? Because most of the, this difficult training, this complicated and boring stuff fell into those four categories. And then there was a couple of little changes that they might have to make. The trainers started getting excited. And what happens when you get excited? You get engagement and become you become positive and it's contagious, isn't it? Years ago, I was running my Staple It To Your Head How To Make Your Training Stick workshop. And I met a guy and uh, it might have been Shane. Hi, Shane. How you doing? Good. And I said to Shane, so what are you training, Shane? He said, I train in tax. <laughs> and it's so boring. It's so boring. And I said, great. Thanks, Shane. So nice to meet you. Then I met John. G'day, John. How you doing? And I said, so what do you, what do you know, what your area of expertise? He said, I train in tax. And it's brilliant. Do you know why it's brilliant? I said, no, why? He said, because it's relevant to everybody. There's only two things that are relevant to, to everybody, and that is death and taxes. And I train in one of them. <laughs> and he got excited about it. Now, which you know, workshop, do you want to attend? <laughs> Shane's going, I want to attend John's. <laughs> so this is the challenge that we have. Facts tell, stories sell. How many fruit and veggies are we supposed to be eating every day? Yeah, five veggies and how many fruit? Hands up if you're eating two fruit and five veggies every day. Okay, we've got a couple of liars up the back there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is the challenge that we have, is we know this stuff. We know this is going to make us healthy. We know it's going to be good for us. And, but even if all that, all that facts, all that research, we still don't do it. It's really hard. Here's the interesting thing. 
people buy on emotion and justify their purchase with logic. I did this once, said this once to a guy, and he goes, oh, yeah, that's women for you, isn't it? <laughs> and I'm going, really? Oh, yes, yes, no, I'm a, I'm a scientist. Yes, I always look at the double-blind, multi-centered, placebo-controlled trial. I said, really, with everything? He said, absolutely everything. I said, I'm just looking at the, uh, the, um, the glasses in your pockets there. They, they, they appear to be Ray-Bans. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I said, well, it's funny because I can take you down to the local Cancer Council Society and get those really big, chunky glasses, which will actually offer you better protection than your Ray-Bans, and they'll probably be one-tenth of the price, and they'll also pass with the Australian standards, and, and he's going like this, and I'm going, so I suggest, sir, that you bought those glasses on emotion because they're bolac. Now, never do this to a participant in your workshop because they'll hate you for the rest of the day. <laughs> but we do. We all buy on emotion and justify a purchase, the logic. And this is where stories come in. Because stories, black that out for a minute, stories are sticky. I fly a little bit for work, and yet I had this morbid curiosity with that airplane crash program. <laughs> and, you know, I sit there having heart palpitations watching it, but it's kind of like I can't, can't draw myself away. And I was watching it one time, and there was a pilot and a co-pilot. And the co-pilot's saying, oh, um, Bob, a bit concerned here because uh, we seem to be losing petrol out of engine number one. And the co-pilot said, oh, yes, yes. And this is what he did. He leant over and he flicked the monitor. <laughs> and he went, oh, yeah, must just be a computer problem. So he said, no worries, we'll just pump petrol from engine number two over to engine number one. And the co-pilot's going, OK, well, he's the boss. Oh, we'll do that then. And it was still going down, still going down. Then engine one conked out. Oh, that can't be good. We'll just pump over a little bit more fuel from engine number two. And then engine two conks out. And here they, and oh, by the way, in the meantime, they'd flown over a whole lot of airports. Oh, there's an airport there, there's an airport there. Oh, no, it should be right. Flick, flick. It must be just a computer malfunction. So here they are, 20 kilometres, or 20 minutes, I think it was, from the nearest airport with no fuel. Everything's blacked out. Apparently this little, um, you'll be glad to know, this little thing pops out from the bottom of the plane, which you know, the air whizzes around so they've got enough power to actually steer the thing and all that jazz. He managed to lay, like, fly the plane. And everyone said, oh, what a brilliant pilot. He's a hero. I'm going, no, he's not a brilliant pilot. And he's an idiot. And the co-pilot should have said something. Now, Dan and Chip Heath call this, this story. He says, stories they say stories provide simulation, which is knowledge about how to act, and inspiration, which is the motivation to act. And this is why stories are important. Simulation, you can see how to act. Motivation, no, uh, the motivation to act. And I thought, how cool is that? Because that video, I would want to show every single co-pilot. Because I'd be wanting to say to the co-pilot, when should if he spoken up? How should if he spoken up? What would happen if they, you know, they wouldn't have made it to this airport, for goodness sake? This is something you should be able to question. You know, I'd like to show that video to nurses as well, to speak up to doctors. Because what we're talking about here is a problem of hierarchy. But I can just say, oh, you know, it's very important for you to speak up to the co-pilot. It's very important to you to speak up to the doctor. You know, I know the doctor's a professor and, and all this jazz, but you need to speak up to the doctor. I can tell people that. But if I show them this story, it provides simulation, which is knowledge, and inspiration, which is the motivation to act. Isn't that fabulous? So this is why facts tell, but stories sell. And we're all salespeople. We're taking this information and saying, you know what, this is valuable. I know your brain is already full, but this is valuable. I want you to take this, and I just don't want you to learn it. I want you to do something with it. Hmm. So I like this. It makes people care, and it generates them to action. And I thought about this, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to call this head, heart, and gut. Because I think we need to win over all three as trainers. Head is what we think about something. Heart is what we feel about something. And the gut is are my instincts telling me this is the right thing to do. Do I trust this person enough? Or is this just crap? So think about that with your stories, head, heart, and gut. OK, so let's have a chat now about how we do this. Because you're all natural storytellers. Who's got a whole lot of war stories up their sleeves? 
Yeah, of course we do. We've all got experience. But I want you to go beyond the war stories. Oops, wrong button. Here's something I want you to think about. I want you to think about people, place, and event. Because the interesting thing when I was researching this topic is that telling stories, more importantly, personal stories, will make you seem more credible with your audience. And you're thinking, yes, 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 I know that. It's my war stories. But it's not just your war stories. You might tell some stories about your family holiday. You might tell some stories about your, your kids or something silly that happened when you are at a restaurant. That can actually increase your credibility as well because it makes you appear more human. It makes you appear more likable. Likable is one of the pillars of persuasion. So you're becoming more influential. How interesting. <coughs> So if facts tell and stories sell, I want you to become a collector. One of the clients I was working with, I was talking about this and how important it was. And he, I said, yeah, tell me a story. Tell me, tell me what happened to you last time on holidays. He said, oh, well, we had a bit of a scary incident. And I said, really, what happened? He said, well, we were on holidays in Bali, and it was fabulous. And we were having such a great time. We are on this little resort. And... You know, my kids were so full of life and, you know, gee, it was great. And you know, my, my wife and I are walking hand in hand and the kids are running ahead and it had just been raining, it was a little bit slippery. And my son ran round the corner, slipped and fell through a plate glass, plate glass door. I said, oh, my God. He said, yeah. I said, what happened? Is he okay? He said, oh, well, look, you know, he got slashed and all this. And, oh, you know, it was just, you know, it was horrific. But, you know, he was fine. They, they, we had a really good first aid person there. You know, he needed a couple of stitches. But thankfully, you know, major arteries were seven. And he was okay. And I said, there's a story you can use. He said, oh, how can I use that? I said, well, you work in, a, a, in the mining industry. You work in a fairly dangerous industry. I think you should share that story with, and he was a manager, I said, I think you should share that story when you're talking about safety. Because you can say, look, everything's going well, we're having fun and, and all this is great. But it could have ended in tragedy. And safety is not just something that we sit there and go through the Occult and Safety talk. Something, safety is something we need to act. Ooh, hello? <laughs> Excuse me, that was my other voice talking. <laughs> so safety is something that we need to really embrace because, you know, for me to see that happen to my child, you're my family, you're my working family, and I don't want to see that anything like that happen to anybody. And that story, you know, it triggers the emotion, doesn't it? Because what it's doing is if I just tell you a fact, it's like me putting a grain of sand in your brain. But if I tell you a story, it's like me throwing a net over your brain because it's firing up all different areas. It's firing up the whole of your brain and you're hooking it into your memory because through, with your memory and your stories and, you know, oh, something like that happened to my son or something and it's made it sticky. And the other interesting thing that they do is it creates neural couplings. So what this means is if, I'll give you an example quite, quite um, easily. Just, just sit back for a minute and imagine that you're in my house. And imagine we've walked outside and we've walked down the steps onto the grass and we've walked over to my magnificent lemon tree. So we've plucked off a lemon, really big lemon. Give the surface a bit of a scratch. Close your eyes and have a sniff of that lemon. Oh, isn't that gorgeous? Lemon. Take it inside. We're going to cut it into segments. Now, everybody, pick a segment of my lemon. Pick it up with your hands. Come on, get involved. Pick it up. Squeeze it in your mouth. Now, is anyone's mouth watering? Hands up if your mouth is watering. So I have not only just changed what's happening in your brain, I've also changed your physiology. This is what stories do. Even just a simple little story like that. How cool is that? Because this is what we need to do as trainers. We need to change people. Not just so they know the facts, so that they live the facts, they remember the facts, they can recall the facts, and they know what to do. So people, place, and thing. This is what we had here. We had the place, it was Bali, the people, it was my family, my wife, my kids, and this is the event that happened. So there's how you get a story. Or you might want to use okay, bad, better. This is a really good one to use when you're introducing change. And it looks something like this. This is where it's OK. You know, the software that we're using at the moment, let's say you've, I'm, I'm introducing some new software. 
for our insurance company. I might start with a story and say, I wanted to tell you a story about Brenda. Brenda's been a customer of ours for many, many years. And <clears throat> unfortunately, I think it's 20 years she's been a customer. And unfortunately, you know, a couple of months ago, Brenda got broken into. And Brenda sent, sent us an email recently and said, the break-in was terrible. You know, my, my, they stole my son's iPod. They stole my son's wallet with all his pocket money in there. But what was worse was dealing with, you, with your company. And I can tell you now that what's letting us down is our software. Because our software doesn't enable us to talk to each other. We all know this. We all know customers ring up and say, but I've just told you all this information. And, you know, and then there's customers that had to ha write things out in hand. You know, so what we've done is we've changed the software so the customers can fill it all out in line. We've changed the software so that you, 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 you can access all this. You don't have to ask the customer a gazillion questions. And what this is going to do is make us into the best insurance company Australia-wide because we're the only ones that have this software. We're going to have, you guys, people are going to be ringing up, us up now, not going, ah, they're going to ring up and say, thank you, mate, it's so easy. Who's, it, who's in for that? So this is an example of okay, bad, and better. So rather than people going, oh, God, new software, they're going, wow, new software, yay, I've been clear word. I'm, I'm on the receiving end of all these angry customers, now I'm going to look great. So I think there's lots of examples that we can use okay, bad, better in our training as well. So there's two rules with your stories. Firstly, it must match your message. So the gentleman talking about the sun sliding into the plate glass window, it was all about, it was a different way of him developing the importance of safety. The other thing that's got to be relevant to the audience, they need to be able to relate to it. Now he knew that his audience was like him, that they had kids. That's what makes a great story. So just those two things you need to worry about because otherwise, you know, I can tell stories to the cow because come home. I can tell you funny stories, I can tell you stories that make you sad, but unless it's relevant to you, people are going to go, well, that was fun, but a bit of a waste of my time, really. So it's got to be relevant to what you're trying to make stick, and it's got to be relevant to your audience as well. So I want you to think about developing your story database. Because I never realized it before, but I love stories. And I'll collect them like, like a, a, a bower bird. I'll go to dinner parties and I'll go, oh, that is so good. I need to use that. Or I'll collect them you know, with what my kids do. Anyone got kids here? OK, you have got a gazillion stories you can use that are relevant. And think about your war stories. But mix them up a little bit with your personal stories about what happened to you at that dinner party or what your kids did that was funny the other day. Have a look at books. I love reading. Uh, on the flight over here from Adelaide, I was reading um, um, The Game Changer. And I oh, love it by an Australian author, Jason Fox. It's all about how we create change. He's talking about change in organisations. I'm going change in people's minds with training. And so far, I'm about a third of the way through, I'm thinking, yep, this is really resonating with me. You know, where else? If you're working in an organisation, share some stories. The, main, the other main rule I should include is the stories have got to be true. So if it's someone else's story, don't pass it off at your own. Say, this is what happened to somebody else, and I want to share it with you. So start thinking about what you can collect, what stories you can have, include in your database and share with others. Now I'm looking at the time and I'm going, woohoo, we have time for questions, which I wasn't expecting, but we do. So let's get some questions happening. And from cyberspace as well. Okay, don't hit me all at once with questions, everybody. Come on, just... <laughs> Who's using... Yeah? One of the main problems in the training side of things is we go through the process of getting our particular cert for or whatever. It sets aside a process, but it doesn't actually set aside how we can do that. What you do here, I find quite enlightening with the fact that you're giving the process of what we should be doing, which should be part of the program. Uh, I don't know... I'll what do other people feel about that? 
Yeah. Look, just, I just want to comment on that because I, I've done, I've been in your shoes and I have delivered training that I didn't write. And it is really hard. It's kind of like karaoke because you're not too sure what's coming up next. <laughs> and one, so this is where it's, it's, if you're delivering something and it might not be your own material, you know, I really want you to own it. I really want you to say, oh, bugger this, I'm going to own it. I'm going to make it my own. Think about what's the objective. The objective is, and I had a guy who was uh, training forklifts, and he said, my objective is to have them competent and confident forklift drivers at the end. And that was his goal. How he got there was up to him. So I think uh, as trainers, we need to... And I remember one time I was working with an organisation... One time at band camp? No. <laughs> I remember one time I was working with an organisation and they had the most horrific PowerPoint slides I've ever seen. It was about 80 of them and it was all text. And I went into that training room saying, look, I'm terribly sorry, but the PowerPoint's broken, so we won't be able to use the slides. So I'm just going to have to talk to you and we're going to have to be interactive and just run it from there. Because they, I just... I didn't tell the organisation at the time because I, they would have gone, oh, but, you know, we're an RTO and you must do blah, blah, blah. And I'm just going, yeah, whatever, because I just thought, no, it's, it's really, it's not going to work. It was death by bullet point. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, Denise from Great Lakes, uh, we have some long-standing officers that come and be trainers and they have fantastic war stories, but they're so exciting that the recruits get so engaged. Yes. Yes. I work with SA Police in Adelaide and it's the same thing. Boy, war stories. They've got blood and guts to spare. You know, they've got <laughs> guns and tasers. And, and so this is the thing. This is why I come back to what's your message? What's your objective here? Your objective is to have them to be safe, competent police officers. You've got to come back to that. So you've got to link it back. You've got to say, so yes, share a story, but say, okay, so what would you do in this situation? How would you react? Let's talk about it. Let's get into groups and talk about through this. What could we have done differently? So it's got to come back to the learning. Yeah, but I know they, they, they go, hey. Now, I think we've got a, a question from Cyber. They've gone? No. No? Nope. We thought we had one? Well, we, we may have, but they, they're not going to ask. Ah! <laughs> what I would ask is, yeah. could you repeat the question? Oh, yes, sorry. Repeat the question. Yeah, so the questions were, thank you so much, <laughs> I should know this, the question was about what do we do with police officers that have these war stories and they just go on and on and on. Now, there's two, uh, on that I'll come back to that again because I think every presentation is a balance of information and entertainment. So they're going, yay, it's entertaining, but it's not getting the information across, so it's got to be that balance. Now, there was another question from over here somewhere. Who's got some stories that really stick with people? Does anyone use stories that really stick? Because it's, it's, I'm also presenting escaping PowerPoint purgatory, so I'm kind of going through my brain now trying to, ah, oh, I can share one with you that I'm not talking about with escaping PowerPoint purgatory. I was working with some trainers up in Darwin, and they worked with a lot of Indigenous Australians, and they said, look, you, you know, these people are so... They're so enthusiastic, but we're having trouble. They're not comfortable in the exam situation. We're having trouble making stick. And so I said, well, let's have a chat. What have you done in the past? What are you doing? And they came up with this fabulous idea. What they did was they were talking about the layers of the skin. This was a beauty therapy course. And one of the trainers went out and bought some cream, some jelly, some fruit, some cake. Any idea what she was making? A trifle. Yeah, a trifle. So she came in with a big vase and she said, this is the layers of the skin. And she put some fruit in there and then she put some cream in and then some jelly and some cake. And I can't remember the, you know, the epidermis, there's you know, all the little layers. And she got everyone involved. They all helped make it. So how thick do we need to make the dermis in relation to the epidermis and, and the subcutaneous? And what about this and what's that? And, and everyone got involved and everyone did it and everyone went labelled it all and everyone ate it <laughs> <laughs> afterwards. And everyone got 100% in their exam because that was so important for them to understand all of this because all their whole, that underpinned their whole learning on everything else. I thought, how cool was that? Yes. So, um, and so training is secondary to their subject matter yep. expertise. Um, and quite often um, getting them to move from um, the, the, com 
use of blankets that can be a PowerPoint and using a PowerPoint as it should be, which yep. is a resource and a tool, not the, the whole show, you know, that kind of thing. What strategies would you suggest to encourage to get people to kind of feel more comfortable to, you know, like you are now, you know, you haven't even got the PowerPoint on, you're there. So we know that that is just being used as a tool to yeah. reinforce your message. But I still think... So how, the question is, how do we win them off PowerPoint? Because, yeah. okay, essentially what a, a lot of trainers do is... And when I started my business, I didn't even use PowerPoint. 13 years ago, I didn't use PowerPoint. And a colleague of mine said, oh, but you must. And I said, oh, why must I? And they said, because you won't be seen credible unless you use PowerPoint. I'm going, oh, really? So there's this credibility factor. There's also the fact that people are using PowerPoint as a teleprompter or as a tool. So there's two things you need. You need three things, actually. You need your handout you, you, or your workbook. You need your PowerPoint presentation if it's visual, just showing photos and things like that. And I'll talk more about this in Escaping PowerPoint Purgatory. And then the third thing is you need your own speaker's notes. But one of the things that was taught to me, you know, just after I'd done my cert for many years ago and I was chatting to a trainer and, and I came from a speaking background rather than training background, so I had to learn to make stuff more interactive. That was my soft spot. But he said, here's the steps you need to know, Sharon. And I thought, I still remember them to, the, to this day. He said, the first thing is you give them the theory, then you allow them to chat about it, then you get them to practice it, and then you review. Because the challenge that we have is our attention span is this big. Now, it's not that we're getting dumber. It's just the fact that we've all got Google in our, in our pockets. And uh, we just, instant gratification information, we just Google it. So those steps, again, were give, give them the theory, get them to discuss it, because that helps us explain it and cement it, then practice it and then review it. And I, it's very simple. And there's probably been a lot more complicated stuff out there for you know, learning and embedding information, but I still come back to that. And if I find myself talking or reading off the slides or something like that for a period of time, I just come back to that. I'm trying to break down my training into 10-minute increments now because I know that people's attention span is, is short. I know that, yes, I'll give them a good story, but to cement that story, I need to say, so what would you do? So what would you do differently? How does this impact on what you're doing? So it's all about chucking that net out there, making this, the, the story sell something, but getting them to cement it and own it and know what to do in that situation. Can I share a story? Please. Fabulous. We chose all the place under the plates that way. And then we walked over the bridge and we watched the cars going by and we sort of said what sort of cars were what and what kind of number plates did they need. And she was almost so apologetic for not following the yeah. session plan. Like, yeah. oh my God, that's just fantastic. Yeah. Because the people actually learned a whole lot more. It did revive the session. They look forward to coming back the next day. So for the people on in Video Land, hi again. Everyone wave to the people in Video Land again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the story was, was that they, they had a very boring... Um, uh, training room stuff and she said oh my god everyone's falling asleep come with me out to the car park they went out in the car park and had a look saw cars going over and, and everything and, and that's fabulous I did a similar thing with the guys that were doing training in Tasmania these were CFS and I don't know about you but if you join the country fire service you want to hold a hose don't you you want to spray something you don't want to you don't expect to be stuck in a room you know hearing about and so I said to them look we're, during lunchtime we went outside and I said what's this on the ground here, and the fire, fire said, oh, that's uh, leaf litter. What level leaf litter is it? Oh, it's three grade litter. What is that hill there? Well, that's a, um, an ascent face or something. I can't remember all the terminology. That's an ascent face and, and this. And so where's the fire going to go? Well, it's going to collect here, and then it's going to go up that tree, and then it's going to go up this face, and then it's going to go. And what about over here? What's exacerbating factors here? What do we need to do? I said, this is how I want you to do your training. You know, rather than show diagrams, go out and show them the stuff and say, do you have this lying around your home? That is a tinderbox. 
So I think this is, you know, where we need to think differently because our attention spans are short. And there was something when I did do, um, I think it was Dirac guys, might have been the Dirac guys. Was that one of the guys that, that went, rang up one of the mining places? I think it might have been them. And said, um, oh, I'm working on, you know, some big mining equipment. Do you have some old equipment that you can give us? And the mining guys went, nah, we're not going to give you old equipment. Went, oh, well, at least I tried. We're going to give you new equipment. So he got some other guys from another department to do a training thing to lay a slab, and they laid a slab, and then he got the, the, the mining guys to deliver this new equipment on their, put it up and bolted onto this slab, so these guys weren't learning the theory in a the classroom, they were out there working on this new equipment in, on this slab that they built themselves. I think, how cool is that? You know, you never know what you can get away with until you try. And I just try stuff, some stuff doesn't work, and you go, oh, that was a bit of a mistake. I don't think I'll try that again. But then there's other stuff and you go, wow, you know what? I heard that click. Has anyone run any training when you kind of heard that click? Isn't that an exciting... This is why we stay in business, isn't it? Because we hear that click. And I don't get that click when I speak at conferences. I get that click when I'm working with, you know, 16 people in a training room. So that's what I live for is that click. So try it. Facts tell. Stories sell. If you want more information, here's my, you feel free to link up with me on LinkedIn or send me a tweet if you're into Twitter. And I'll have this written up in a blog shortly on my newsletter, my, my blog site, which is called The Grab. So I'll put it on there, a bit of a summary about what we've been talking today. But get your stories, collate them, make them sticky and have fun with it. Authorised by the Government of Western Australia, Perth.